this meeting to order. Roll call will show that all five board members are present, as well as Axel Semity, who is our representative from the class of 2021. Um, so at this time, uh, I invite you to stand and join me in this. As well program. as Axel Semity, who is our, our representative. From I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, at this time, uh, Kim, is there communication that you'd like to share? Yes, there is. While the Safer at Home order has been lifted and gatherings are not prohibited by an enforceable order in our community, the Greendale Board of Education will continue to meet in a virtual environment because of the construction underway in the Greendale High School Library. Board meetings will continue in this format until the regular space at Greendale High School is available for in-person meetings. I want to remind the public that the board continues to welcome comments from the community as part of the board agenda. Persons wishing to address the board are asked to email citizens comments at greendellschools.org or to call 414-423-2701 at least 30 minutes prior to the start of the meeting. Comments submitted after 30 minutes prior to the start of the meeting will be read at the next board meeting. During the meeting, comments will be read by an administrator during the public comment portion of the agenda and are limited to three minutes or five minutes if representing a group. To be included in public comments, citizens are asked to include their name and address. Comments received without a name and address of the person submitting the comment will be shared with the board in writing, but not included in the public comment portion of the meeting. I would like to welcome Axel Semiday as the new student board member for the class of 2021, following the departure of Megan Jacobs, he is observing and will be officially appointed at the August 3rd meeting. The 2020 graduation will take place on July 18th and plans are being finalized. Students will each be assigned a 15 minute window between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. to cross the stage and receive their diploma. They may be accompanied by family who will have a front row view of their student crossing the stage. In addition, there will be photo spots set up in the stadium Students will only will return to Gavinsky Stadium between 3.45 and 4 p.m. The one hour program will begin at four o'clock and include live speeches and pre-recorded musical performances. It will be streamed live on YouTube for families and the community to view. Events of the day will be recorded and edited into a two hour ceremony in the traditional order for each graduate to keep. Graduation details have been sent to families and the Greendale Health Department participated in planning and approved the measures to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, 2020 summer school for all students grades K through 12 will be taught online. K through eight sessions will run July 6th through July 31st and ninth through 12th grade summer school will run July 6th through August 6th. Registration has closed and we will provide further information on attendance and participation at a later date. Greendale schools will launch the new website later this month. The updated site will feature a new look but navigation will be similar to the current site. Families will receive an email announcement when the new site is live so they can become acclimated to its new features before back to school check-in online registration begins in early July. The June 9th Joint board, School Board Village Board meeting will be rescheduled as the Village Board did not have a quorum and requested to reschedule. The board and public will be informed of a new meeting date when it is determined. An update on the Welcoming Diversity Action Plan will be presented at the joint meeting until that meeting can be rescheduled, I wanna share my communications with the welcoming diversity team surrounding progress towards the plan as they pertain to the schools. The education team has been discussing the goals around representation of diverse communities within the curriculum. I want to acknowledge the work over the last two years to advance the goals established in the October 2019 plan. The social studies curriculum has been reviewed and the units informed by C3 have considered multiple narratives in historical and current contexts. The work continued with discussions around including more texts by authors from varied races and ethnicities, valuing and affirming the perspectives through stories of real and fictitious characters of color. I thank the Greendale Education Foundation for grants at all three elementary schools to expand guided reading libraries to include greater representation of students of color. I thank Linda Thomas and Sandy Spear, as well as our elementary library paraprofessionals for focusing on collection development for representation of children and families of color and from historically marginalized groups of people. And I'd like to thank the class of 2010 who has proposed a charitable fundraising event in lieu of their canceled class reunion 
to focus on equity and representation through texts for our staff and our students. These efforts support the Community Welcoming Diversity Plan for Goal 1. And the practices team is working to finalize plans for an artist of color to develop a community mural through input and participation from the community. And I'm looking forward to sharing more about the plan at the joint board meeting. And that concludes my communications. All right, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, that the board did receive a question from a citizen um, last week regarding um, our open meetings and public comments and, and First Amendment rights. And I just wanted to clarify and make sure that everyone's clear that Wisconsin's um, open meeting laws grant citizens the right to attend and observe open session meetings of governmental bodies, such as the Greendale School Board. Um, and open meeting laws, however, does not require a government body to allow members of the public to speak or actively participate in meetings. And unless otherwise required by law, the school board is free to determine for itself whether and to what extent it will allow citizen participation at its meetings. And as we all know, uh, the Greendale School Board has chosen to set aside a portion of its open meetings for public comment, uh, even though it is not uh, required to do so as part of state law. Um, and during the, this unusual period of the public health emergency, the Greendale Board of Education has determined that virtual meetings are the most appropriate method of conducting school district business to ensure the health and safety of board members, administration, uh, district staff, students, um, and the community it represents. Uh, the board provides a live stream of its meetings through YouTube to allow for the public to virtually attend and observe its open meeting sessions. And the board provides a process for the continuation of its policy, allowing for public comments by the way of citizen submissions of written comments that are then read into the record of the board proceedings. Uh, the live chat feature, the YouTube live stream is not required to be opened by the board. And because of the, some of the nature of the comments, the board has elected to turn off that live chat feature and instead take all public comments through written submission process or by calling that number that Kim outlined earlier. So I wanted to share that. Like I said, I do, we do receive communication from a, a, a citizen here in Greendale. Yes, so I have one submission for um, public comment tonight from Mary Grogan. I'm writing to express my extreme disappointment in your unilateral decision to silence the First Amendment rights of the citizens participating in the live chat portion of your virtual school board meetings on YouTube. You are elected officials and as such do not have the legal right to silence any comments made on social media platforms unless those comments are threatening to cause you harm. It is hypocritical of this board in particular to cite board policy 411.2, bullying and harassment policy as your reason for doing so. Policy 411.2 doesn't even address virtual school board meetings conducted by adult elected officials. Additionally, you ignored your board policy 411 rule regarding racial discrimination when it came to Shanice Knox, sparking two years worth of protests in the community. When board policy is self-serving, only then do you choose to apply it. This school board continues to operate behind closed doors, under the table, surreptitiously, and does everything they can to silence any outside voices or outside opinions contrary to their own. An active community group is already working to replace Joe Carpito and Kim Salem in the spring of 2021 due to the poor leadership patterns that Lex Jones clearly raised in the live chat comments during your 518-2020 school board meeting. Any Greendale residents who are interested in reading the live chat comments from the 518 2020 school board meeting are welcome to contact me. All right, thanks, Kim. Um, and just as a clarification, um, that is someone's perception that we operate under the table or behind closed doors. That is not the truth or the reality. Um, then moving on with the agenda, uh, first item on the agenda is a review of the board meeting minutes from June 1st. So is there a motion, any questions? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve. I move approval of the regular board meeting minutes of June 1st as outlined in agenda item 1.1. 1 .1. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the regular meeting minutes of June 1st, 2020. Any further discussion? Can I call for a roll call vote? Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda, um, the financial report for this month as well as checks and disbursements. 
Jonathan, I know you're going to be sharing um, an update. Is there anything that you want to share at this point? Uh, so for the month ending May of 2020, um, we had revenues of 63.69%. That was slightly below prior year. And so identified that that was due to a smaller property tax payment that we receive now. The remaining portion of that property tax we will receive in the month of August. Um, then on the expenditure side, we were at 67.7%, and that is below the prior year of 70.06%. So we've had ongoing discussions of areas that we're looking at and targeting um, as we anticipate being under budget at the end of the 19-20 um, school year, and that played into a decision and recommendation regarding prepayment of Fund 38 debt. So I would be open to any questions the board has about the monthly financial report. So are there any questions? Otherwise, we will talk a little bit about the final amendments for this current budget, as well as um, budget and fee discussion for the 2021 school year. Jonathan, I just said that one thing uh, we discussed this, I, I think um, the overtime is going to be uh, possibly reconfigured next year so that it's not so much over budget. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. But it's still within that department. So it really hasn't been over budget. It's just been over in that category. Yeah. So there would be an overall operations budget. And so the amount that that's over is still within the scope of the operations budget that was approved by the board. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve this month's checks and disbursements. I motion to approve checks in the amount of $459,672.25 and disbursements in the amount of $2,546,177.92 for a total amount of three million million $5,850.17 as outlined in agenda item 2.2. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve check and disbursements totaling $3,005,850.17. Any further discussion? Then I'll call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Thank you, Jonathan and Noel. Um, next item on the agenda is personnel. So we've got uh, a teacher appointment, um, including a speech language pathologist appointment and a teacher retirement. So anything from administration that you want to share or update? Um, just that we thank Lynette Hockey for her years of service and um, she is retiring at the end of 2019-2020. All right, uh, agreed. Uh, so any other discussion? Otherwise I look for a motion to approve. Move to approve agenda item 4.1 for approval of teacher appointments, speech language pathologist and an appointment and accept teacher uh, retirement. Is there a second? Second. Uh, there's been a motion and a second to approve personnel as outlined in agenda item 4.1. Any further discussion? All right, then I call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. And uh, just to echo Kim uh, amid six comments, we'd like to thank Lynette Hockey for her many years of service as a social studies teacher at uh, Greendale Middle School and wish her well uh, in retirement. Uh, so next item on the agenda is, uh, this is uh, approval of the 2020-21 preliminary budget and school fees. So as we enter July, July 1st is the start of our new fiscal year. Uh, so we need to approve a budget. Uh, and as we discussed at our last board meeting, there are still a number of unknowns. Uh, we anticipate that the state will reduce revenue and, and will reduce state aid. Uh, at this time, those amounts are unknown. Um, but Jonathan, we'll let you kind of talk through where we are at and where we landed um, for this preliminary budget that will be approved tonight. Yes, and I'd, I'd like to remind the board that as you're approving the preliminary budget, this is how we'll start the year, but you don't approve the final budget until the fourth Monday in October. So 
Um, this is preliminary in nature. So taking a look at our preliminary budget, so our update for today. So again, our, our agenda, just revisiting those guiding values. So what are those principles that are important to us in how we um, allocate resources, that process and that communication plan, the development, and how the COVID-19 pandemic um, impacts us in terms of how we develop the budget. So again, our 10 guiding principles and this we've talked about um, and have shared with uh, community members through School Finance 101 and through our district citizen finance team. And so I think it's very valuable that we've had that ongoing conversation. We've been able to get feedback um, about the things that we think are important and our leverage points for students. And so that helps us to design um, those four steps to the process that are all guided through our vision for the Greendale School District. So at this point, we're at the point where we would get to our preliminary budget approval. So number four on this slide, um, the, the we will have the annual meeting in September and then by October 15th, we will have all the information needed for the final budget. So we're gonna need the student pupil count and our state general aid, which we will get by October 15th. So while we are setting a preliminary budget so we can operate as of July 1, there's still more information that we will need. And that's why there are assumptions built into the budget. At the May 18th conversation, we discussed some of the review steps that we had gone through um, in building that budget. We've continued on um, with uh, both external discussions of the budget and prioritization, but also internally. Um, so in the last month since our last discussion, the main focus has been working with our district budget team and getting input from them in terms of how we prioritize uh, within our budget uh, through the guiding um, uh, guidance that there could be significant revenue impacts from the state level uh, due to the current COVID pandemic. In approaching that, we've stayed with certain budget commitments. So number one, we're caring for the social and emotional wellness of our staff and students um, and how we've prioritized in design of the preliminary budget is to work to avoid any layoffs of district staff. Um, there's a commitment to the teacher salary structure, but at this time there, we cannot proceed with a salary increase until more information is known. Um, we've been working with staff and looking at possibilities thinking for alternative um, revenue sources or um, ways that we can save. I mean, we've had consistent and frequent communication regarding that. An update in terms of the outlook for 2021, we have the actual dollar figure that we would receive from the federal government through the CARES Act, which was one of the first stimulus bills that came at the national level. And so this is in addition to what we receive on an annual basis in Title I, that we have this one-time allocation of $302,000. Um, and so those are dollars that are gonna help us um, provide continuity of programming, as well as address needs that are coming up both through virtual learning, as well as we look forward to having students back on site, those things that we may need to um, accommodate in order to do that in a safe fashion, whether we're thinking about like physical barrier spaces um, or uh, cleaning products or other equipment that would be needed um, in order for students to come back in as safe a fashion as possible. And so we have a district team that's coming together and having those conversations every week um, about how we can design it and what those tools may look like so that we um, utilize this in the, the, the best fashion possible um, in helping to support our students. One of the big changes that came as we neared the end of the budgetary process was we had a large increase to our health insurance expenditures. So by the end of March, we were at 110% of our premium costs. Um, and so at that point, once you're over 100%, then the health insurance company can't make money that they, they want to see that under 100%. And so as we've been discussing renewal options, we've had an understanding that there would be 
um, potential cost impact to that. And so when we received our initial renewal, that was at 19% on a full funded plan. We're with the Group Health Trust right now. And so we've been working with r, &R Insurance on the bid process and they've um, negotiated renewal options from multiple vendors in the range of 11.9% to 17%. Um, additionally, there's self-insured options available, uh, meaning that the school district would be paying a lot of the claims more directly and would only have in full insurance above a certain dollar threshold per individual. So we've left open options here. Um, just from a budgetary standpoint, it's a significant increase um, and it is a priority to maintain quality benefits for our um, staff members, um, but we have to do that within the budgetary dollars that we have allocated. So right now our timeline is we will be working to finalize a renewal by June 30th. Um, we have a timeline in terms of a decision on renewal with the group health trust that we have to meet by the end of this month. And that's for a plan year that would begin September 1st. Jonathan, as you look at the, the renewal and um, you know you mentioned that in March, we were about 110% of our premiums. Have, have we done or has the, the insurance company been able to assess where that's coming from? Is it just across the board? Is it a handful of you know, very specific, unique situations that contributed to that? Um, have we done any assessment as to what has contributed to that, um, th that amount? Yes, so there are specific um, individual high costs that came up on the plan towards the timeline where we were coming up for renewal. So as those projections are being made for the following year, that's built in um, to the, the costs, uh, the projected cost increases as the, the health insurance companies can anticipate. Um, there's some impact to just what will happen in the market in general with COVID, um, but it is definitely also being driven by the, the high costs that we have locally. So prior to the start of the pandemic, when we talked in March, um, this is based on current legislation. Uh, the state biennium budget had additional dollars in the revenue limit of $179 per student. And so the anticipation was that total revenues within our operations budget would be at $33,245,655. $245, That's current law. Um, and then on the expenditure side, um, the same. And so you see there the items that we had built in in terms of salary increase, um, health insurance we had built in at 5%. So we just discussed where that is today, um, but where we had that built before. Um, I'll target dollars for potential additional open enrollment out. Um, targeting additional OPEB trust payments. So at the May meeting, we discussed with the board what the current reserve is there. And on a annual basis, we're putting aside about $200,000 towards OPEB costs, um, post-employment benefits. And so this would have added another 100 to get it to 300 for the 1920 year. Um, some dollars for staffing modifications, uh, school private school voucher increase. We get a revenue limit um, increase for that, but um, there's also additional costs. So we become the pass through entity for private school vouchers. And we did talk about that in depth with the community during school finance 101 um, sessions, which are also posted um, online. Our utilities, we had dollars identified for additional electricity and gas. Um, our marching band, uh, pupil transportation for trips, and uh, contracted pupil transportation, just the increase in our contracted fees. So this is still the current law, um, but we anticipate modifications to that because the state will not receive the revenues that they anticipated um, when they passed that biennium budget. So we've had conversations about what some of those scenarios would look like and we identified five. The ones that we view as the most likely and have been having deeper discussion around 
on this slide are scenario number two, which would be at $634,000, um, up to the third scenario, which is um, $1,580,000. At the high end, uh, what we reference is a $2 billion potential loss of revenues at the state level. That's on about 18.8 billion projected revenues next year. So a little bit over 10% of the state revenues would be lost. That is a figure that the governor has provided. And even though it has not been confirmed by the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, um, we would be planning around that discussion that that's a potential loss at the state level. So in our current preliminary budget, um, we identified revenues and expenses at $32,550,339. Um, the model that we're using for that assumes $0 per pupil revenue limit increase. So instead of the 179 per state law, um, we would assume it would be pulled to zero. The special education aid revenue would be at 26%, and we anticipate a 50% loss of summer school enrollment revenue uh, because fewer students will be participating in online summer school um, during the summer of 2020. We anticipate that there'll be a budget repair bill that will modify the, the state school budget for the 2020-21 school year. The timing of when that happens is still to be determined, but based on um, the decline in sales tax and income tax for um, property taxpayers throughout the state, we anticipate that coming. And so we've um, looked at designing a budget around that. Um, so the reduction of 695,000 is basically taking current law and saying that with the, the scenario that we're proposing, um, we would be reducing in terms of building the preliminary budget, we've made these reductions and the bulk of those dollars um, are in salaries, 565,000. And so we identified that right now the district is holding on making any modifications to that until we know more about that, that state budget. So then I will switch and I'm going to stop that for a second. Any questions so far? I did have a question uh, going back to, I think it was the third slide um, that just talks about um, the student numbers, you know, the minimum and maximum numbers that we um, approved as a board for the grade levels. And I, I brought this up before. I don't know if this would impact the, the budget or how it would impact the budget, but um, the middle school for some reason has more students as their minimum number than the high school does. And, and in the past that kind of concerned me, I thought maybe instead of being at 26, that number should be at 25. And I was just wondering if and how that would actually impact the budget that was changed and when, when actually we can um, take action on that if we do decide to change that number? It does not have an impact on the budget this year on account of the fact that that minimum number is used to determine open enrollment space available. And at this time, we don't have any new open enrollment seats at the middle school level. So whether it was 25 or 26, because the minimum class, the, the, the class size um, projections are above 26, um, it, it has no impact on this year's budget. And in terms of when you can change those, that is part of our open enrollment projection process. And you cannot change it until we complete our open enrollment um, offering of seats. Okay, and when is that again due? Uh, we, so it was delayed because of COVID. So applications closed on May 30th um, and we can offer seats after the, uh, first Monday, on the first Monday after the 1st of July. So we will be offering those seats and you'll hear some more about open enrollment um, as we talk about the budget projections and the possibility of opening seats um, later in July. Okay, so then that could be a conversation that we have say mid-July to August or no? No, you would need to, 
you would not be able to change the policy until open enrollment is complete. So if you were to open new seats, you can't change the policy when you're in the process of offering seats. Okay. So it would be some time after the start of school and all of the open enrollment seats are occupied. Okay, is that something we could maybe just like earmark for, for a discussion at a, a future meeting then? When we bring forward open enrollment policy and open en and enrollment projections before we d make decisions on opening seats, we can have that discussion. Okay, all right, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I think of with that lower number is, is that lower number will impact how many additional open enrollment seats we can offer. So if we lower that, then that means that we will we are able to offer fewer open enrollment seats, which would then impact our overall budget. So you know, as Jonathan showed us, we are having more students graduate than we are through open enrollment than we are bringing in. So we are seeing a decrease in the open enrollment revenue. Um, now we are also seeing resident enrollment increase, so there is some offset there. But I think, you know, keeping all of that in mind um, as we go through that open enrollment process. So then in terms of getting to the detail um, of how we may tackle uh, that projected state shortfall. So on the revenue side, we know that we have a range of estimated shortfall between 634,000 to 1,580,000. Um, we also know that the low end of health insurance increases that we've received to date is at 12%. So that would be $280,000 in additional operational budget impact. And that would get us to 1,860,000. Um, we also have as part of this agenda discussion regarding student fees um, and potential reduction there. And so we identified that that being an additional $30,000. So on the reduction side, um, we're in this $1,860,000 range um, with the potential for additional action um, to that, that last number of 1890000 so I identified that a lot of the work in the last month has been conducted with the district budget team. So we've got staff members that are teacher support staff, um, parks and recreation, food service, uh, facility staff that have been having conversation of over a about seven weeks uh, and thinking outside the box of areas that we should consider. And they helped us to create a survey um, to go out to all staff members to ask some questions about um, opinions on um, areas that we could uh, have look at reductions uh, this year to account for that potential state shortfall. And then as a team had some discussion on that um, with the understanding that I would prioritize those items um, and bring that forward um, in alignment with the input that they that they provided, that that would be um, filtered through um, so that their voice um, came through and how we were thinking about priorities um, in the, the budgeting process. So I wanted to go through some of these items so the board's aware of the list that we've identified to this point. Um, so we've got these uh, numbered. So our priority one, we talked as a board about prepayment of Fund 38 debt, and there was $800,000 that was prepaid of that debt or will was approved to be and will be at the end of June. And of that amount, it will cover um, six remaining debt payment years. And so the feedback from the board was consider the six remaining years and how those dollars are allocated. So at this point, our priority would be to have a one sixth of that amount, that 800,000 um, put towards uh, uh, programming for the 20, 2021 school year. And so that's our first item. Um, then there's our Fund 27, our reimbursement and transition of positions. So here we've got some dollars in the changeover of staff, as well as um, a larger cost that we've had in our special education account that would bring additional revenues. So there's some dollars there. We've identified about 35,000 
the exact dollar figure will change based on new staff members that come into the district and where they, they land. Uh, our summer school amount. So we've identified 50% of the supply costs and know that the way that we will run summer school virtually will look very different um, for that, but there will be, there will be expense savings. Um, there's also significant revenue loss um, with that that we will offset. Uh, number four, we've identified dollars through the CARES Act. So the CARES Act funding, um, we have a third of that amount, $100,000 that's identified for programming. Um, that leaves us an additional $200,000 that we will utilize for one-time costs, um, as well as have dollars to sustain the district into the following year. So it can also be used in the 2021-22 school year. And we will utilize the 100,000 here for sustaining programming, um, knowing that we've got um, virtual instruction and staffing that we need to have on site uh, to support students um, from a safety as well as health standpoint. And so having dollars targeted to be able to support those services. We identified the potential to reduce the employee travel budget. That's just a logistical based on uh, the, the limitation of traveling and going to conferences um, that we would make that change. On the curriculum side, the grade six through 11 math curriculum is being readopted, but the payments are being spread over three years rather than one year. And we restructured the 12th grade renewal to um, continue on with the current materials. Here, their savings in the current year, if possible, um, it would be appropriate to finish and pay the remaining two years worth of the curriculum items and pay for those outright. Um, because if we don't by the end of next year, then that will be something that will play into future curriculum adoptions but this was a way that we could target $72,000 in savings. Our workers' compensation was renegotiated last June. And so we had the potential based on uh, our ability to have a low percentage of injuries and claims that we could receive more dividend than we have in the past. And so we estimate that at $20,000. We are still looking at open enrollment and in July, um, we will provide an update to the board um, and identify whether there are additional open enrollment seats that could be um, brought up within the class size targets that already exist. Number nine is our Fund 41 capital projects. So the district has set aside $200,000 annually for capital upgrades. These can be items like roofing projects, uh, major renovations, a uh, parking lot and asphalt. Uh, this last year, there were dollars that were set aside over a multiple period of time to upgrade the football field turf um, with the, the Fund 41. And so here's uh, an item where um, the dollars could be held for a year um, on a one-time basis given the, the impact of the state budget. And then um, as new long range capital plan is being developed following the construction this summer, identify where those investments would be going forward. So things could be held for a year, but eventually those things that are coming up due, whether it's parking lots or roofs that are coming up due and need to be replaced, um, those projects would still need to be done in the near future. Number 10 deals with vehicle replacement. So the idea of holding that for one year, we have both maintenance vehicles, we have a busing for our special needs transportation, as well as extracurricular transport. Here we did a replacement in spring and would have the ability to hold that on a one-time basis, um, but would need to then continue on with rotation of vehicles as they come up at the end of their life expectancy. Number 11 is tuition reimbursement. So there are some staff members, teaching staff that are continuing to be in a tuition uh, reimbursement situation because they're in uh, master's degree programs. And we would grandfather those that are currently in the program, but then would suspend 
for future staff members. So as that happens, um, there's up to $20,000 savings um, by making that change. Number 12 the, and number 13 both deal with the technology budget. So we've looked at our needs on a long-term basis. We're looking out five to 10 years and made sure we're making the investments in equipment. Um, but this year there was a significant investment in getting to a fiber line. And so we have the ability to reduce the, the old internet line, which is through spectrum uh, because we now gain our internet through the fiber. And so the spectrum acts as a backup. Uh, there's the potential that that could be, uh, if you lost the prime fiber line, if that were cut for some reason, you could temporarily lose service. Um, but the network of uh, entities throughout the Metro Milwaukee area are working to connect that fiber line um, from different directions. So eventually it'll be redundant um, amongst its own line. So we feel like now is a time where we can look at making this change and know in the near future, we will still be able to have a backup um, to that internet system. Number 14 deals with building budgets. And so we would make a 5% across the board modification to those building budgets. And then in terms of matching that at the district level, we would also make a modification of $5,000. Number 16 deals with extracurricular salaries. And so changing those across the board by 5% um, for salary amounts for the 2020-21 school year would lead to a savings of $21,500. Uh, number 17, so I identified earlier in the presentation the goal, the earlier goal of trying to add more dollars into the OPEB uh, prepayment of future liabilities we'll have. Um, so here, this line item would change that instead of growing it from 200 to 300, um, we would keep that roughly the same as prior years. Number 18, looking at limiting of after hours events. I think there, there's just consideration of the change in the way that we're operating due to the pandemic. Um, and it's likely that there'll be some modification to how we use the buildings. Uh, we, as we're getting our construction done, we would love our community to come see and, and be part of our facilities. Um, but we know that safety of students and how we provide a safe environment for the instructional day will be the priority. And so we'll have to monitor our ability to be able to provide after hours events, but it will likely be more limited than it has been in the past. Number 19 is dealing with professional development. So uh, there is a lot of work that occurred in the month of June that would ordinarily occur in July. Um, so here we're ahead in terms of some of that uh, work that could be stipended. And so uh, again, on a one-time basis, there's a significant savings of the 55,000 that exists within that, that budget uh, that we can do in the following year that will come later in summer. And so here we've identified um, that there'll be a significant savings to that 55,000. The salary increase of $565,000. So that is what the savings would be if there was a full freeze to salaries. 21, we asked multiple questions, understanding what the health insurance benefit renewal rates were, um, understanding possible modifications to the plan so that we could keep a similar benefit structure, but figure out how to keep that sustainable. Of multiple options that we provided, um, changing premium share of staff from 10% to 12% of the overall premium was the one that was most favorable of those options, and that would lead to a $92,000 savings. Um, that's something that we would have to make a decision on as we uh, go towards the renewal of the health plan of whether we would make that, that change. Um, and then number 22. So here we are getting towards that $1,860,000 that I identified on the, the prior tab. Um, and here, this was not the preferred um, way that the, the board described um, utilizing that Fund 38 debt. But as that state shortfall would become more and more significant next year, 
Um, this is an alternative to look at in terms of sustaining staffing, sustaining programming in the buildings is to come back and look at uh, the remainder of the $400,000 that was prepaid, that will be prepaid for the 2020-21 school year. So any questions on that? Jonathan, my, my question has to do with the benefit premium share to go from 10% to 12%. Yep. Is that what gets us down to a 12% year-over-year increase? Or are there other changes to the plan, uh, like higher deductibles or things like that, that gets us down to that 12% year-over-year uh, -year increase? So... 12% is before any changes. There are no other changes that we're proposing to the benefit plan. So there wouldn't be a change to deductible or maximum out of pocket. Um, that amount would reduce the total overall increase. Um, but it, the 12% the is the pure total increase that we would receive if we made no changes. That's the lowest bid that we have right now. And so that does not involve higher deductibles. Does that involve changing um, network of, of doc, doc, the, the network that we'll be offering or things like that? Or is it just truly a, a more competitive bid? Um, someone else is looking to uh, win, win the bid for, with Greendale schools for the next school year. So similar networks in terms of breadth. So it could be a different provider that's managing that plan, um, but it would be similar in terms of um, accessibility of doctors in the area. Okay, thank you. And, and can you go back to line uh, or number 17, I guess, allocation of prepayment for OPEP liability, the $110,000? That savings was was in relationship to, to to what again? So I think originally in developing the budget, it was a goal to increase how much we were putting into that OPEB prepayment, and so this would be um, un uh, not not making that increase from the current year to next year to how much we put into that OPEB liability on an annual basis. So the preliminary budget in March uh, indicated that we would be putting a total of $300,000 investment into the OPEB liability. And we talked about our unfunded liability being approximately 1.6 million. So what this is saying is that the budget would have approximately $200,000 going into the OPEB account um, and holding back on, a, on an additional 100,000. So we are still putting money in um, payment for OPEB liability, but not as much as we had discussed in March. All right, thank you for that clarification, Kim and Jonathan. With respect to kind of the education as a benefit and then also the professional development um, dollars, do we, you know, I'm thinking about all the things that are kind of different or have been different over the last few months and kind of what that might look like moving forward. Um, do we think that that is a wise decision based upon potentially needing to provide additional professional development so that our teachers and staff could really um, thrive in, in whatever next year looks like? Well, there's two things. One is that some of that professional development has already happened and is counted and has been paid for in the 2019-2020 budget. Um, and the second piece of that is, is that teachers continue to have an obligation for professional development within their existing teacher contracts. And so it is the additional paid opportunities that would be um, that we would forego. And those would be things like um, extensive week-long institutes for training um, where teachers are compensated and we're paying a fee for that. We know that we don't have a need for some of those institutes this summer. And it's really around the, how do we, um, how do we transform our teaching? And that has already happened. Um, there, there is some equity professional development that are, we, that are several days long that we talked about 
But again, those are happening this month in the month of June and is part of the 2019-2020 budget. Does that, is there, I'm assuming that it's not pulling that to zero. There's still some funds in there for professional development. It's just dropping it $55,000. Correct. And okay. some of that is funded through Title II. Um, so that funding will sustain as long as Title II money is sustained. And then um, there would still be local dollars for professional development. It would just be reduced. Jonathan, the budget that we'd be approving tonight does not take into consideration these additional budget saving ideas, um, but, but administration and yourself, you vetted this list to have potential um, almost $1.9 million in savings, uh, anticipating that the state is going to reduce our overall budget um, sometime this fall. So we're not actually approving this listing, uh, but you're sharing this with the, the board tonight so we have insight into it. Um, we will approve a budget tonight. And then as the state funding becomes more clear, uh, we may have to readdress, we may have to go back to this listing um, to help us get to a, a budget that is reduced based on uh, more clarity that the state will then be providing given its funding. Is that how I should understand it? Correct. So the, the work was being done so that there are multiple options. And so there's a number of items on that list where we will hold back. But as we know more about the state budget, we would bring back that district team together and talk about how we um, pivot um, with that updated funding figure that we would receive from the state. So essentially at this time, those are those are allocations that would be held. We wouldn't make those payments. We wouldn't make those investments until the budget was finalized. So they're on hold and put aside so that they are truly capable of being eliminated if we um, do have dramatic changes to our revenue based on state changes at the state level. That's a good point, Kim, because we may be four months into a budget um, before we have that clear direction from the state and its funding. So. Um, as, we, as we look to hold back these items, is there a priority to putting them back in if what we see as a shortfall isn't as large as what we think it's going to be? Yes, that's the list that Jonathan shared. That is how it was prioritized in the survey of staff. So if we wanted to adjust the prioritization order um, as a board and as an administration, we certainly could, but that is the prioritization as interpreted from um, survey results of our okay. teams. Thanks for that clarification. I didn't, I misunderstood that. Quick question. So with um, respect to holding, you know, I, and maybe I misunderstood this, but if we have to, um, by the end of this month, figure out health insurance um, and that plan, what, what does that basically mean? Does that mean that we, because you can't go back then after we've negotiated that plan to change it uh, for this year. So I'm just kind of curious how that fits into the, the pattern. Yeah. So we will make a decision on health insurance. What will change is um, we would have to make a premature or an early decision as to whether or not we're gonna increase the employee premium share. So what you saw on the reductions was uh, taking into account the um, projected health insurance increase. And so we would have to make a decision sometime in August or late August as to whether or not we would be increasing employee um, contributions to premiums. And so that would be the one thing that we would have to decide that we would have to decide earlier that we couldn't hold back on. Okay. I think the other thing that I, I really liked uh, um, the way Jonathan put it out and, and I think it's uh, indicative of some of the board's discussion previously is uh, particularly item one and item four. We're planning for the future. So, you know, yes, we've made additional payments um, to fund 38, uh, but we're not taking that entire amount 
um, and this upcoming school year. You know, I think like you mentioned, we could have uh, we could have taken all that amount in this uh, upcoming school year to allow for that, but we're planning for the future saying we know we're going to have to start funding that again um, after uh, a number of years, after six years. So let's not let's not um, take all of that savings in year one. Same thing with the CARES Act. You know, it's intended to be spent over three years. Um, so by, you know, by allocating it again, we're not taking it all into year one. Uh, we're planning for the future and giving us um, some ability to continue to react to our budgets uh, in the next couple of years because we anticipate uh, the state to have at least, you know, a, a two or three year uh, budget shortfall. So I think that's important and, and I'm glad you called that out. I, I agree with that on, um, uh, you know, I, I would assume that especially after some of the things that are going in to kind of uh, put some duct tape on budgets uh, this year, you know, it's going to actually be harder potentially next year um, as we get some space between the pandemic, hopefully, and, and uh, kind of getting back to whatever the budgets will look like moving forward. So I agree. I think that this is going to be something where it's going to be a little tight over the next not just one uh, academic year, but uh, and fiscal year, but uh, at least probably two, and, and maybe even a little bit longer before that kind of bounces in, in that direction. Um, with that being said, is you know some of the items that were in that list were items that are what I'll call less or more sustainable, depending on which ones you're talking about. So if if they're gone, they're gone. Uh, so like the curriculum was a good example, I think, as you mentioned, Jonathan, right? So once that's done, we, once we're done paying it, we don't have that as an expense anymore. Um, so it's not like um, other things where we know it's gonna come back at us every single year. Um, so I, 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 you know, whatever we can do to make sure that we're prioritizing some of those things and it sounds like that's more or less done, but there was some woven in throughout um, that prioritization list, which could, you know, come back to uh, to haunt us, I guess. But the other thing I would say is, you know, from what I'm seeing in other people in other districts, we're doing a much more thorough job than, than uh, some of our peers. Uh, at least that's the ones I've looked at. I haven't looked at every district, so I can't speak for all of them, but I commend kind of the, the work that the, the admin team and, and obviously Jonathan and Kim in particular, you know, you've been doing to really kind of think through this and, and, and rally the community, rally the staff and get their input and insights into this because um, it's going to be important for us as a community to, to make sure that we thought through everything that we can provide the best possible educational experiences for our kids. So I would point out that Julie's been a significant part of the budget team too. So really appreciate her help um, in navigating that and, and having the conversations and our staff members that gave up of their own time to go deep dive into the budget because we didn't want to make these decisions at a surface level. So we went in pretty deep to go through building budgets to go through departmental budgets so they understood what we were really talking about before we came to these discussion items. So the, the last item in terms of the budget was about um, advocacy related items. And so um, as you see their significant impact that could be had on our budget for the 2020-21 the school year. Um, so shared some information um, with the board and this came up at our last school board meeting. Um, the Nonpartisan Learning Policy Institute projects that almost 320,000 school district positions could be cut nationwide um, if states cut their education budgets by 15% due to the economic recession. Um, so significant challenges um, beyond even what we discussed here this evening. Um, Governor Evers wrote a letter to President Trump noting that Wisconsin alone is expected to lose more than $2 billion in tax revenue unless the federal government intervenes. And so there was a group of national organizations, which includes the Council of Great City Schools, so large metropolitan schools, a National School Board Association, National School Superintendent Association, National Association of Elementary Principals, um, State Directors of Special Education, the National Education Association, National PTA, and others um, that made 
made this request for $202 billion for additional stabilization funding um, and others for the 2020-21 the school year to stabilize budgets and avoid significant impact to educational programming. And so within that, they identified specifically 175 uh, emergency funding to, to governments to support local school districts, 13 billion for IDEA, 12 billion for Title I, and 2 billion for technology um, upgrades and enhancements to support um, virtual learning. So uh, as administration, we would be um, looking to the board for questions or direction in terms of next steps, um, but providing that information. There have been a number of school districts locally that have started to pass um, resolutions or have discussion um, regarding this issue and the potential that at the federal level, um, con Congress and the president would need to um, all come together if there was going to be additional stimulus money that would support K-12 education um, as well as state and local governments. So what, what type of direction um, or, or feedback does the board have? Uh, I, I think at the, the last meeting I said, you know, I, I think we've shared our story with the state legislatures uh, pretty well. Um, I don't think it's the state that we're going to be looking to to help fund any of this. I think the state is saying that uh, there are budget shortfalls. Uh, I know the, the federal delegation in, in Washington, D.C. is picking up and looking at some of these things. So I guess that's where I was saying at the last board meeting that we may want to um, communicate with our federal uh, legislators um, in support of some of this. Uh, but I think this, you know, like like Jonathan said, it warrants conversation at the board level to say, is this something that we want to bring forward with a resolution, um, or bring forward with just having uh, directing administration to uh, communicate and share the story with the the, the, the federal uh, congressmen and, and senators. Um, so just wanting to know where people are at with that. Well, I definitely feel that our story needs to be shared at the federal level. Um, I, I believe as Brian Style, our, our access to uh, Washington, um, I think it should be a joint effort with administration and the school board so that we're all kind of pushing for the same thing and that they're, they're hearing the voice of the entire body. I, I would agree with Kathy, but I wouldn't be opposed to doing a resolution I, I would think that would make an even stronger statement um, coming from the entire board as a resolution, my opinion. So Aaron, Kim, any, any additional thoughts or comments, concerns? I think, it, I mean, fr from my perspective, I think it would make sense to kind of highlight what we're seeing and what we're knowing and sharing that uh, effectively. I also think, you know, maybe even, you know, one of the things that potentially is missing from some of the conversation is what, what are we doing to maybe think about innovation and continuous improvement, not just uh, getting back to what normal used to be, but how are we kind of thinking forward and are there uh, resources or other things that might be made available for, for districts that are already, you know, are leading and, and not trying to be complacent um, in this work, but really thinking through things differently to make sure that we're always kind of putting the education of our students for, first and foremost. So that would be my one uh, kind of note of maybe add addition, if you will, uh, to the resolution say, here's what we're seeing, here's what we're hearing, here's what we're knowing and kind of feeling, if you will, from the district perspective and where we're concerned are, where we're concerned from a budgetary perspective. Um, and then, you know, the other offering some solutions or other things as part of that as well and not just pointing out where the where the concerns are and i think we as a district are ahead of other districts in that area um and i think we pointed out some of those things where other districts haven't so th those are just my thoughts as i'm thinking through this you know, i don't want to just point out the uh the issues i think we're seeing things also from a solutions perspective that we could present um So that I think that 
that makes sense. Like you said, it's it's not just a simple resolution and we're done with. Um, you know, it, it needs to be a resolution coupled with you know what are we seeing, what are we doing, what what is that complete story and that complete picture. Our administration has shared the story of how we transition to digital learning with our federal representatives, uh, Style, Baldwin, and Johnson. Um, and as we think about um, what some of the national recommendations are on some of that stimulus, there are pieces that are being lobbied for that would not actually impact Greendale schools. So for example, in make technology infrastructure improvements to make digital and online learning more accessible because of the moves that we've made. And we have um, widespread access to online tools in our area. And we've already made investments to make uh, digital tools available to our students. Signing on to something like that would not benefit Greendale schools. And as, as we are thinking about and looking at our budgets, there are going to be pain points and pinch points. But as Thor said, continuing to be innovative, um, whether or not a resolution is uh, necessary to ask for more money when we have other solutions to point out. Um, we will absolutely do it if the board would like to move forward with that. But in, tonight what you saw is that we were able to, to um, analyze some options for reductions um, to address those um, the shortfalls. And while there will be some pain in that, um, we will continue to innovate. So if the board does want to pass a resolution, we can certainly do that but I am not sure that uh, passing a resolution to put, pass along to our federal officials, our, our representatives in the US um, Senate and House of Representatives will have the, the impact that we need um, where we have opportunities to solve problems at the local level. So we should absolutely tell our story of innovation and um, um, to help them to generate ideas for how we can manage the financial shortfalls right now. So, so what does that look like then, I guess, as you're describing it, Kim, is that um, do you, should you and I work together to craft a, a letter to our congressional, uh, our congressmen and, and our uh, U.S. senators, or, or what, I guess, help me understand what you think that looks like then. I think what it looks like is here's the ways that we're innovating and making savings. Here's the pinch points and the impact that it's having on learning for our students um, and that um, we can support through modeling innovation that they could use to um, help address shifting learning. Um, so well, I think it's really important that we uh, level the playing field when it comes to digital access. Um, much in the same way that during the Great Depression, there was a need to get telephone lines across into rural areas. Uh, it won't have a direct benefit on the Greendale schools, but if it's something that, that we wanna say that equity, we value equity and, and so stimulus funding to level the playing field around technology is something we wanna put in there, then it's something that we can put in there. So um, yes, I'd be happy to sit down with you, Joe, and have a conversation about what we might wanna to put in there. We could also have that discussion at the board retreat about what we want to um, put in there and uh, discuss that in about a week and a half when we meet for the board retreat. Okay, so why, why don't we do that? Why don't we, uh, if the board agrees with that, that uh, when we meet for the retreat, um, maybe we can share a couple of examples or samples um, to react to. Um, based on some of this conversation tonight, I, I think what you're hearing is we want to tell our story. We want to make sure that the federal government is is aware of what's happening. Uh, we don't want to just say money is a solution. We, like you said, we want to be able to say, here is how we've uh, addressed the, the problems here in Greendale. Um, but at the same time, we also want them to know that there are going to be some pain points that we'll experience um, and, and they need to be aware of that um, so that as they are uh, looking to see is there, if there's another round of, of stimulus money, uh, what, that would, what that could look like to help address some of the, our needs. Okay. So you are posted to take action on the preliminary budget this evening. So Jonathan is presented where we're at with the preliminary budget. And so we're still in the action item section of the agenda. So I'm not sure if um, 
you want to take a motion and continue discussion or if you're ready to take action. I think, I think before before that, just one other item. So as part of this agenda item, our student fees. And so just wanted to mention there that there were two options that were brought forward to the board in consideration of student fees. Option one would be keeping a freeze of the current um, student fee levels. And option two um, was making a 20% reduction to those student fee amounts for the 2020-21 school year. And so that was discussed previ previously and we brought that forward. Um, option two would have a financial impact of $30,000. What, what are people's thoughts? So as Kim mentioned, you know, we are supposed to take action on the preliminary budget as well as school fees. Um, so any further discussion about the school fees then, or I guess we really didn't have a conversation about that. Jonathan presented that as this is what it would look like um, in, in an overall budget of the, the 30, um, $33 million. One of the, um, my, my thought is that we should freeze the student fees versus decrease them by 20%. And I think part of that then could tie into a communication plan with our community around fee waivers for you know anything with free and reduced or other things where we have um, already in place. Um, I know that we have those fee waivers in place for even the park and rec and for other things. So how do we just communicate that for those families that are struggling to make sure that they have access uh, to the things that um, they should have access to, but that way we're not, um, you know, we're, we're trying to trim and put everything all over the place on our budget and, and pull things all over the area. So I think by decreasing this, that just adds a little bit more stress or strain on uh, the work that we're already trying to do uh, across the budget and or across, yeah, across our holistic budget. Yeah, I would agree with Thor. I've given it some thought and I think a freeze makes more sense at this point, just given everything that's been laid out for us and what we're looking at. I would also agree with the Thor and Kathy. I think a freeze is where it would be appropriate at this time. I agree also um, with the freeze um, after taking into consideration um, just the points that we're already trying to, um, the cost savings that we're already trying to do with the budget. Okay. Um, do we, I, 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 I certainly understand and appreciate the, the um, the overall decision of the board. I guess what I would add is that my thought for, for asking for this is that there are going to be families that aren't going to qualify for free and reduced uh, fees um, because of you know work situations or furloughs or uh, reduced work schedules or, or things like that. So that's where I was thinking it would be um, an important, um, an, an important, um, measure that we could do uh, to help with that. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, we're calling it a, uh, a fee freeze, um, but we haven't, uh, we haven't increased school fees in the past typically. So I guess, you know, it, it is a freeze, but it's something that we've done for the past couple of years where we have not increased fees from year over year. So, um, so I, I would still support a 20% um, fee reduction. But I certainly appreciate that the, if the overall mood of the board or the overall decision of the board is to, to stay uh, with where we are at and not uh, make any changes given where we are at with just the, the fiscal realities. What percentage of our families receive uh, free and reduced lunch that qualify for it? We know Approximately 25%. And it's probably a little bit higher at the elementary school levels. Um, we don't see that typically at the, the secondary levels for whatever reason. Yeah, so our elementary buildings are between um, 24 and 35 percent and our middle and high, our middle school building is actually above one of our elementary schools, but our high school has the lowest percentage, even though it's got the highest count of students receiving free and reduced lunch. Yeah, I think, Joe, you, you bring up a great point on um, families that just may not qualify for, for the free and reduced lunch, but still might not um, be able to afford. 
the fees. Yeah, and to go along with that, I was going to ask, is there, um, do we do anything typically for families who don't qualify? Is there any avenue they can um, take in the event that, you know, with the furloughs and things that they're, they're coming across hard times? Um, are we able to do anything for those families? We could certainly campaign in the way that we do for certain field trips where we could offer on um, for families to donate for, from those that have to be able to offset costs of families who need assistance. Um, Kid Boosters is another one, but Kid Boosters does not typically uh, donate for school fees. They will donate for other purposes to support a student um, thriving. What about the... the I was, ahead, that, I was gonna say that I do know, and Jonathan, I don't wanna speak for the business office, but I do know that uh, the business office will work with families if if it's helpful to um, institute like payment plan or co make collections over a period of time. I, I think there are avenues that way that the, that the business office will work with them um, that may help uh, a family situation. Yes, absolutely, you are correct. We would um, talk through. Um, and set up a payment plan that would be flexible for the family if that's what worked um, best for them. Um, that's always an option that we have available. Noel, were you gonna add something? Uh, you actually kind of touched on what I was gonna say, so that's fine. All right, any other questions then regarding the, the preliminary budget? And just to clarify, because we talked about a lot of numbers and for those that are watching, um, essentially the budget that we are looking at um, in this line item would be just uh, the increase. And the only reason there's an increase is because our resident enrollment and our membership is, is growing. Um, so it's actually taking into consideration all those different uh, decreases that we talked about, not the, not the extra lists we talked about. Um, but that's why there's a one point was it five, nine or five, six percent increase? Um, and that's all based on membership enrollment um, increases. So I'd. Um, yeah, so, so we're, we're posted to approve. Uh, I guess I, let's, let's do with the school fees then. Um, is there a motion to approve the school fees as outlined in agenda item uh, six point, or I'm sorry, four point two? I motion to approve uh, school fees as outlined in action item four point two. And that with the with the with the staying freezing fees for the 2020-21 school year. Correct. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion, a second to uh, approve the school fees as outlined in agenda item 4.2, uh, keeping them frozen at the 2019 2020 school year. Any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I'm going to vote no, um, as for the reasons I shared earlier, uh, but motion carries. Uh, then we are motion to approve the 2020-21 budget. Um, Jonathan, we've got the overall budget of $32,550,339. Is that what we need to approve at this time, or is it a more complete budget than that? Yes, that would be the operational budget that you're approving at this time. Okay, so then if we go back to the slide deck that Jonathan uh, walked us through, um, slide 18 talks about the budget outlook for 2021. Um, preliminary budget is set for $32,550,339. $32,550,339. Any discussion? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve that amount. 
I move to approve the budget of $32,550,339 for the 2020-2021 um, fiscal year. I second that. There's a motion and a second to approve the 2020-2021 preliminary budget for a operating fund 10 balance of $32,550,339. Any further discussion? All right, then I call for a roll call vote, Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes. So that is the, the preliminary budget. And as Kim Amidzik mentioned earlier, we will be back uh, once these numbers are finalized uh, to approve a final budget um, at the end of October. Yes, and we will also present again to the community at the annual meeting. Exactly. Um, all right, so then uh, the next item on the agenda is the 2019-2020 budget amendments. So these are, um, we reviewed these at the last board meeting uh, as we are finishing up on the 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year. These are some uh, accounting items that, you know, align where the money was actually spent and, and things like that. So Jonathan, if there's any, anything that you want to touch upon here. So I just reiterate again that this includes the prepayment of $800,000 in Fund 38 debt. As we identified earlier, we are under budget and expenditures through the month of May. And so continue to expect that our operational costs will end up under budget, um, but that there was dedicated use of fund balance in order to prepay debt. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Any other questions or discussion? All right, then I'm looking for a motion to approve the budget amendments in agenda item 4.3. Motion to approve uh, the 2019-2020 budget amendments as outlined in uh, agenda item 4.3. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the budget amendments um, for the 2019-2020 school year. Any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I'm yes. Motion carries. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, you'll see this is one of a couple of items that we're going to talk about where we are um, working with other entities. And this one has to do with uh, a shared service agreement that's been in place now for a couple of years with the village for joint IT services. Actually, we first approved it last year. So we just finished our first year and shared services with the village for IT. Um, and it has provided to improve efficiencies and economy of scales between the two entities And the village has um, been able to um, work with Ryan in a consultative and we've been able to continue his services and retain his um, retain him. So I recommend that we continue with an agreement that's underway. All right, thanks, Kim. Any additional conversation or discussion? All right, then I look for a motion to approve this agreement with the village for joint IT services. Quick question is the, so I'm assuming we approve it first and then it goes to the village for approval? Yes, I believe they're posted to take action on it at the regularly scheduled meeting tomorrow. Okay, is there any has there been any conversation with the village around concerns with this or is this working well with the village as well? I think that they believe it's working well right now. Ryan serves as strategic strategic leadership and is available on call for day-to-day -day operations, but they do have a technician that works for the village um, and there is shared supervision of that between Ryan and the village manager. Okay. I move up. Oh, sorry. thank you. I was going to say, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve. I move approval of 6603 shared service agreement for joint IT services with the village as outlined in agenda item 4.4. 4. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the uh, agreement uh, between the village and the Greendale School District for IT services. Any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote, Kim? Yes. Noel. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Thor. Yes. 
and IMES motion carries. Um, next item on the agenda is the 2020-2022 Park and Rec Committee appointments. So every two years, we have the ability to appoint uh, two adults uh, from our community, as well as a, a student from our community uh, to serve on the Park and Rec Committee that then uh, advises our Park and Rec Department. So tonight, uh, you're seeing the names of, of three individuals. Uh, two of the adults uh, are currently uh, part of the Park and Rec Committee, and then the student uh, is a, a rising junior who will be joining that for the next two years. So any questions or uh, comments? I was just curious as to how, um, and I have no problem with any of these um, individuals, but just what the process is for um, these appointments. Is it something that they're solicited for or do is there an application period or how does that work? I, I would say for the two, uh, for Joy D. Bacharya and Rachel Bush, they have already served on the board. So uh, we will continue to appoint, or okay. we, we will reappoint them. So I, I think we've reached out to Jackie Schweitzer, um, who has, con has been in conversation with them or, or will be in conversation with them um, about continuing to serve in that capacity. So for those individuals, it, it hasn't been a, uh, a reapplication process. For okay. Them. Uh, for the student board member, what we did was we had a number of rising juniors apply to be part of this school board representatives. So um, later this summer, you'll have Paris joining the, the school board to represent the class of 2022. Um, Anna, uh, applied for that role. And uh, I believe she also talked to Jackie Schweitzer. So she was not selected uh, to be a student re representative to the school board, uh, but her uh, information and contact information was given to Jackie to be part of that. So that, that was kind of a, uh, an application process where she applied to be part of the student board member representative. Um, we selected another student so her name was given over as a potential um, candidate for the park and rec. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I, I think what you also see with these three individuals is a, a growing um, focus of the board to make sure that uh, the voices of all of our community um, is heard and, and making sure that uh, we have people represented uh, the, the diverse nature of our, of our village. So uh, if you're familiar with Joy Deep or Rachel or Anna, uh, you, you know they'll be a, a good uh, addition to uh, the park and rec and um, their voices will be uh, a great addition to that board. So any questions or comments? Otherwise I'm looking for a motion to approve. How often do they meet too? I just uh, was curious, is that once a month? Typically, it's, yeah. is it every other month, Thor? Yeah, so it's part of the park and rec. Uh, it's it's typically every, every other month. This is a two-year assignment. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to align it so for two years so that we don't have, there's a continuity. You don't have people rolling off um, and then becoming, you know, having to spend a year just becoming familiar with uh, the practices. Uh, uh. I move approval of agenda item 4.5, the 2020 to 2022 Park and Rec Committee appointments. I second. There's been a motion, a second to approve the 2020 2022 Park and Rec Committee appointments. Any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am, yes, motion carries. Uh, so just thank them. Uh, Kim, you'll, you'll contact them, let them know that they're being been reappointed and thank them for uh, their their past service. Yes, we will send them a letter. All right, great. Uh, next item on the agenda, since this is the last board meeting of the current fiscal year, uh, we are setting the meeting date and the calendar of reports. So this is something that we had some conversations at at the last board meeting. Uh, you'll see in highlighted in red on the 
uh, calendar of reports, we made some changes. Uh, I think we, we the one date that we changed was uh, in January where we uh, scheduled it for the fourth Monday of January. So that's not to uh, conflict with Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Uh, I think all the other dates are pretty standard. Uh, I think we had to update the, the April date um, as well, um, just to correct that. And then you saw where we've added a, a couple of dates to talk a little bit about uh, the diversity, inclusion, and equity updates uh, in the, the district. And then uh, in August, having part of the district safety plan, the school resource office update. So anything, Kim, that you want to highlight or call out on the calendar of reports? Yes, we on the calendar of reports, one of the things that is left blank right now is a board book discussion. And administration is reviewing books at this time. And if anyone had some suggestions that we want to consider, uh, we could identify the book at our July or an, our August meeting because our first time on the calendar of reports to address the book is in September. Um, there are three areas that we could focus on. One would be board governance, given the newness of the members of the board. The second would be um, trust and community engagement. And the third one would be to continue our study around equity and um, representation and racism that we have been reading about in the book Biased um, and extend that with another read in that area. So if the board wants to discuss what uh, direction we want to take, we could certainly discuss some. I had shared some um, options that the administration had considered in each of those categories with the board in the district update, including texts like The Color of Law and How to Be Anti-Racist, um, to a book called The Speed of Trust that, that is a, an older text by Stephen Covey that would be around trust, and then um, several options around board governance. So if there were other ideas that we wanted to consider, it's something that the board should say which direction we wanna go in terms of our focus for our reading and then make a, a decision uh, in the coming months so that we can um, um, amend the calendar of reports. But the, the calendar of reports does put us in position to um, have a book study that we do publicly. Um, so at this point, it would just be about determining what the book is. I'd like to speak to that. I um, I think our work with equity is very important um, to moving Greendale forward. And um, given that we have a new um, director of curriculum and equity, I, I think it would be important for us um, and probably prudent for us to continue the conversation with her in place now and with Maggie Olson. Um, I did have two other books I, I shared with you, Kim, today, but um, just wanted to share with the board. There were two additional books to the list that we saw um, that I thought would be good for consideration. One was actually brought to our attention uh, at a meeting several months ago by a, a resident. Um, it's called Courageous Conversations About Race by Glenn Singleton. And um, it looks like this. And then there's... Um, Another book uh, called Excellence Through Equity, and it um, highlights the five principles of courageous leadership to guide achievement for every student. Um, that's by Alan Blankenstein, Pedro Noguera, and Lorena Kelly. And so if we do decide to go the routes of equity, I'd like us to consider those books as well. Um, in looking at the books that were presented to us, I, I think they all have definitely some merit to us being able to um, have discussions, but I think our equity work for me, for my sake, I think would be the, the probably the number one priority right now. I think I would echo some of what Kathy is saying. Uh, while I think board governance would be certainly something with this new board we would need, I guess I would like to suggest that maybe that's a, a project that the individual board members take on themselves. Um, I know there's books that are out there on board governance, ones you've suggested, uh, but maybe that could be an individual study of each of the new board members rather than a full board discussion. Um, if there would be some book that would include equity and community engagement and trust, that'd be great. Um, because I think both really speak to where we're at right now. Um, I think it's important that we, yes, that we continue our equity work, but I also think we also need to 
talk about community engagement and building that trust back. Um, can I ask what, what book you uh, the board used last year for the book study? Yes, we read the book Bias. So we had our last book study in May, I believe, but um, we addressed it no, the previous October. October. So biased by, um, no, it was any. Jennifer Eberhardt. Yes, Jennifer Eberhardt, who was recently speaking on the current issues. So this was the book that we addressed. Well, and, and if I could just comment on that, I, I think that set the groundwork for us to start the conversation. I think the, the important part, in my opinion, would be to continue the conversation as it carries over to our everyday dealings with the students, because I, I think a lot of our discussion just stemmed around, you know, the systemic racism and bias, but I think it, we need to delve deeper at this point. And as I said, for mention, the, the reason I mentioned before with Maggie Olson on board, I just feel that this, this could be a good direction to go in. Uh, but I do uh, agree with um, Noelle that um, the board governance is also important. And I, I think perhaps even through our board retreat, we could address some of that and then potentially make that another area that we continue to work on without necessarily having a book study, but you know, maybe just more of a discussion piece. I don't know if that's possible. Um, but, and I do agree with what um, Noelle also said regarding the, the building the trust with the community. I think that, you know, so they all tie together and, um, but equity to me still stands out as the uh, number one, I guess. Okay, so uh, Kim, Kim, does that give you some feedback as to maybe what, we, what the board is looking for? Uh, yeah. like, you, like you said earlier, we've got the, the calendar set and we've got the, the book studies uh, listed on there. So from, a, from an administrative perspective, I think we're covered. And then like you said, over the next couple of weeks, um, if you want to just kind of go through the, that list of books and, and some of the ones that, that Kathy has shared, and then um, select one for the board to, to participate in. And, and I, I think, you know, I think there's benefit when everyone from the administration read the same book. Uh, I thought that was good conversations. Um, and I think especially if we decide to go to one uh, that discusses, um, you know, diversity and, and inclusion, uh, that Maggie will be an important voice in that conversation. All right, uh, then in addition, any other questions regarding calendar of reports? Um, I, I have one quick question. Um, for the SRO report, do we go at that point and look at the MOU like as he, I know he gives a report, but do we look at the MOU? I know it's a three year memorandum of understanding, but do we ever look at that at, during that period of time? The MOU was approved in August of last year. And so right. if the board was wanting to revisit that, there's parameters within the MOU. In terms well, I was just asking if we do that, if we do it during the three year period, if, if that's something we, look at as an agreement every year or just? We look at the agreement itself once every three years, but we re revisit and provide information on the relationship and the evolving nature of the work um, during that time on the calendar of reports. Okay, thank you. I just had a question regarding the WASB resolutions. Um, th this is uh, when we discuss the resolutions that will go, I, I believe it's when I go for the delegate assembly. Is that the resolutions that we're talking about? So there's two parts for the WASB resolution. Uh, one is in January, the January 4th meeting, and one is in August. Uh, the August meeting is if the Greendale Board of Education is looking to submit any resolutions to WSB, uh, that's a time frame that we need to get them submitted to WSB. Okay. So if we as a board want to put forth a resolution that we need to do it in the fall time frame, I believe it's typically September, then once WSB goes through their review, they present back to the school district. And that's what you'll see in January is okay. when we give the WSB delegate direction as to how to vote on it. So that's why you see it there on the, sure. the calendar report twice. Right, and I, I just was noticing the August, that's what I was, I didn't see that before. Um, I do have two potential resolutions that I definitely would like to bring up to the board. So that would be the, um, 
uh, August 17th meeting where we would discuss those. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then one um, March 22nd um, for the policy committee meeting should be March 23rd. Okay. We will make that change. So we're meeting on a Monday. Like it. All right, so any other discussion? Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to approve the 2020-2021 uh, dates as well as the calendar of reports. Motion to approve the 2020-21 board meeting dates and calendar of reports as outlined in agenda item 4.6. Do I have a second? A second. There's been a motion and a second to approve. Uh, any further discussion? All right, then I call for a roll call vote, starting with Kim. Yes. Noel. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Thor. Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Um, so next up on the agenda is the uh, SWATSA Alliance Agreement and Resolution. So this is the Southeast Wisconsin School Alliance for 2020, 2021. So again, this is something that we uh, participate in every year. And what I was mentioning with our agreement with the, with the village is this is a, a similar organization where we uh, work together with other school districts, um, primarily with advocacy um, and is the primary uh, issue or primary focus for this organization. So Kim, anything more that you'd like to share or highlight? As we were talking about the possibility of a resolution, our partnership with this group might have more leverage. So and we it might be some an agenda item to bring to that group um, if there was some sort of resolution that they were looking to address. But um, they meet once a month. Um, Jonathan has been attending these meetings and Kathy is the uh, SWSA uh, <laughs> appointment for this. Um, that you appointed last month. So. And, and actually, I can say I've attended um, one, of, one of the meetings with the, with the full board, and then they do have monthly meetings right now for um, school board members, too, and I, I have found it to be very helpful. Um, the one question I did have is a couple districts were listed as only 1,600, and I believe that's because they're actually on the exec board or somehow they're working in a capacity that's serving the, the SWSA, are you aware of that? I think it's Elmbrook, South Milwaukee. I don't remember the other one. Yes, their cost is less because of the service of the, one of their employees. Okay. Elmbrook has been hosting those meetings and South Milwaukee serves as fiscal agent. So they do have dedicated roles. Gotcha. So they incur some additional costs as part of their regular operations in support of this uh, organization. But I would echo, oh, I would echo what Kim said is that I do think it's a way to leverage. I mean, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's like 30 different school districts that come together. And I think there is strength in that voice together collectively. All right. So then is there a motion to approve the SWATSA agreement for the upcoming school year? I make a motion to approve the Southeastern Wisconsin School Alliance for the 2020-2021 agreement and resolution as outlined in agenda item 4.7. I second. There's been a motion and a second to approve uh, agenda item 4.7. Any further discussion? All right, then I call for a roll call vote. Kim? Yes. Noel. Yes. Kathy? Yes. Thor? Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Um, all right, the next on the agenda is again an, an annual uh, agreement where we contract with an independent hearing officer um, to review any um, typical uh, expulsions. Uh, so before uh, the student is expelled, uh, there would be an independent hearing officer that would hear the case and make a determination if uh, the expulsion is in, in, a lot, in agreement with our standard practices and policies. Um, we have not used the services of the IHO in the past, but we have contracted with them for probably about five years now, Kim. That's correct. Five or six years This um, we've contracted and essentially it's a retainer in the event that we need their service. 
and then we pay at the time of um, at the time that we would need to use their services. And you're correct; we have had zero expulsion hearings this year. My my question with that, a, a resident actually was reading the agenda and had the question. Um, I, I know we've been using this service for five years, and I think since my time on the board, it's been maybe used once. Um, or not at all. I, I thought there was one, but at, anyways, um, what I was going to ask is um, how common of a practice is this? That was their question to me. How many districts around are using this particular service um, as part of their agreement? Many. Um, we were one of the last districts to use an independent hearing officer for this purpose and um, it was brought forward that it was common practice and that we were not doing it. And that's why we engaged about five or six years ago. Okay. Thank and you. Kim, just a bit, thanks, good question. And, and I don't think we've used this uh, any time recently. I don't know, in fact, I don't recall us ever using a, an IHO. Do you recall, Kim? Um, I do not recall. It's possible, however, that at some point we, we had one and um, they they might not they might have reached agreement before the hearing was completed, um, but yeah we we do not have we have not had an expulsion in my recent memory. And and, and just to, to make sure I'm understanding correctly and, and it's clear with the community is the IHO is not determining whether or not the student should be expelled. That decision rests with administration. So we provide the, the policies and the guidelines for when the appropriate administration would take action on that. The IHO is um, really making sure that, it's, that the decision falls within our policies and guidelines. They're not actually the ones making the decision. They are determining whether or not the decision that's been made uh, is in compliance with our policies and practices and procedures. A slight correction, administration would okay. recommend an expulsion. The IHO would hear the case, hearing both um, the administration's evidence and the evidence from the student and the family and would make a determination. And then the board still has the authority to approve that, inter, um, that independent hearing officer's determination. So the board ultimately makes the decision, but uh, the, you are giving the independent hearing officer the um, authority to hear the evidence and advise you rather than you hearing the evidence as a five person board. All right, thanks, Kim. All right, any other questions about this? Otherwise I'm looking for a motion to approve. Sir, uh, any reason we're working with someone out of Madison versus someone local or is that just? Um, it's uh, She's available uh, on call, so. No, there's no real reason other than um, this is the independent. We had a different independent hearing officer and then we switched about two years ago to this one. Okay. All right, any other questions? Otherwise I'm looking for a motion to approve. I thought I was motioning, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, I was on mute. Um, I do move approval of the independent hearing officer for the 2021 school year um, resolution and agreement as outlined in agenda item 4.8. Is there a second? I second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the IHO for the upcoming school year. Any further discussion? All right, then I call for a roll call vote, starting Kim. Yes. Noel. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Thor. Yes. And I am yes, motion carries. Um, next item on the agenda, moving into the new business, we're here to talk a little bit about and hear an update on the curriculum cycle for math. So math is a subject that's being reviewed this year. And um, we're here to get an update on the curriculum cycle for the secondary level, sixth through 12th grade. Yes, yeah, so um, I'd like to thank Sarah Derrick for stepping in to the curriculum leadership role and uh, guiding and leading this process um, for the math six through 12 curriculum review. Um, she's done an excellent job and I think you'll see some of the information that's presented tonight is for information and we will bring this back to you on July 13th for approval before making purchases. Can I share my screen, Kim? Sure can. All right. Give me just a sec. All 
All right. Sorry, I've got two computers up so I can see my notes. There's lots happening here. Okay, um, tonight's presentation focuses on math curriculum for grades six through 12, like Joe said, um, kind of just giving you the base knowledge of this um, elementary curriculum. In 2016, grades K through five approved the use of bridges and mathematics curriculum. This curriculum provides our students with a hands-on approach to learning math, focused on fundamentally learning the math, not just rote memorization of processes. My experience as a high school math teacher and now as an elementary principal has really given me the opportunity to see how fantastic this Bridges program is in order to set our students up with strong foundational knowledge as they move through their math education. Um, Bridges has been fantastic in allowing our students to make gains. As a district, we strive to ensure that we have a solid vertical alignment going from K-12. This ensures that our students are learning the appropriate standards and there's not more or less of certain standards being taught. Gone are the days of teachers picking and choosing what they really, really enjoy or really don't enjoy and making sure that our students are learning all of the standards. Um, vertical alignment assures that when our students have a rigorous and college and career ready mathematical experience as they leave high school. We're in a great place at the elementary level and the review for grades 6, 12 will really put us on the right path moving forward. All of the pieces are really ready, ready to come together. As our students enter ninth grade, they have different options as they move through high school to earn their required math credits, that, which is what you're seeing in front of you. Um, our students have to take three credits, that's the requirement, but many of them take four or more credits of math. And as we do this, I'd like to be fully transparent here. We currently track students in math classes and the tracking starts at sixth grade. We know we need to make a change and we know we need to do better. For example, a student either takes algebra as a ninth grader and only has one track available to them throughout high school. Our students that take any form of geometry as a ninth grader have more than one option as you can see by the diagram. We need to do better. What a student takes in 12th grade should not be determined by what they take in sixth grade. At this point, we consider the possibility of all sixth grade students taking the same class as they enter middle school. However, we don't feel that's appropriate for all of our students at this point. Like I stated earlier, our elementary math curriculum is rigorous and has high expectations. We feel that it's important that our students experience that rigor and high expectations from the moment they start kindergarten in Greendale, which is our soon to be fourth graders. Over the next several years, we may change the sequencing at middle and high school to eliminate the tracking, but we did not feel we were at that point yet. The key word there is yet. Our goal is to set students up for success and putting them in classes in which they have not had the foundational knowledge since kindergarten is not setting them up for success. Even so, with these multiple pathways, our students do leave high school, college, and career ready. Many studies show that students who complete Algebra II by the time they graduate high school have a high likelihood of success at the collegiate level. Less than 5% of our students have difficulty with Algebra II and need some sort of remediation. Nearly everyone completes Algebra II. In the 2014 school year, we made a shift at the high school to ensure that students had the opportunity to complete Algebra II by the end of their junior year, which previously we were doing by the end of their senior year. Um, studies show that students who complete Algebra II by the end of their junior year score better on the ACT. I was actually teaching math at the high school when this shift happened. We used to have students take three semesters, if they needed it, three semesters of algebra and then uh, a semester of like geometry prep and then they would take geometry as a junior. So the highest level of math that they could attain by the end of their senior year was algebra two. And that was not getting our students college and career ready and performing well on the ACT. And we made a systemic shift. I remember sitting in department meetings and having conversations and there was concern. There was stress amongst the staff. How are we gonna make this happen? Our students are going to be able to do this. We were wrong. Students are successful. Raise the standards, raise your expectations. Students will rise to meet those expectations. So we continue to change the narrative as we know better, we do better. An important goal of Greendale School's work is to ensure that we have proportional representation in all of our classes. The next few slides examine our racial proportionality in some of our middle school classes, our middle school, excuse me, math classes, and our students entering algebra at ninth grade. We know that we need to increase our proportionality as students enter middle school. In the next three to four years, as our students have been using the Bridges program since K-5, um, as they enter middle school, we will be talking about different paths and opportunities for them. By increasing the rigor and expectations, we know that we can increase our proportionality and potentially eliminate that tracking. 
So it's kind of small on these slides, but I wanted them on the same, um, I wanted these three graphs on the same slide um, because it gives you the overall percentage of the racial breakdown for students at sixth grade all the way on the left, the students that are taking sixth grade math in the middle, and then our students that are taking advanced sixth grade math. We are seeing an increase of students taking advanced sixth grade math. It's gone up um, over the last couple of years as our students are starting to leave elementary school better prepared for middle school. So you can see that um, we should see the same percentages kind of across the board in each category. And we have a higher percentage of white students taking advanced sixth grade math than the overall population of white students at the sixth grade level. And you can see that we have a lower percentage of Hispanic and Latino students taking advanced sixth grade math versus the overall population of sixth grade. There's work to be done. You can see the same thing in seventh grade. Um, we see a higher percentage of white students taking advanced math and there are no black students enrolled in advanced math in seventh grade. And in eighth grade, we see similar numbers as our seventh grade, da seventh grade data. One of the ways in which we are providing systemic opportunities for our students to ensure that all students have solid math skills going into sixth grade is that Bridges program. We wanna bring all students up and make sure that they are prepared for the classes that they are in. We're starting to see that increase um, in students enrolling in the advanced math. In the 2018-19 school year, there were 53 students in sixth grade advanced math. 2019-20, there were 93. And rolling into next year, there are currently 83 students enrolled in advanced sixth grade math. The curriculum review has allowed us to move the increased rigor and relevance into our middle and high school classes. If our expectations have increased at the elementary level, they should continue to increase as students enroll in middle and high school. And then the last um, data points that I have, as we enter ninth grade, it gets a little trickier to simply look at grade level data. Because as you remember by the previous slide, students have different options as they enter ninth grade. They could take algebra, they could take algebra with math extensions, geometry 100, ge it, it's all over the place. They could take multiple, um, multiple grades. So the algebra with math extensions and algebra only have 159 students enrolled, even though there's 245 students in the ninth grade class. So it gets a little trickier to just look at grade level data. We do see the proportionality of our honors in AP class as a whole. They're there as in our math classes throughout high school, but there's work to be, work to be done in math. You see the fruits of our labor in that sixth grade numbers and our test scores. And you'll see that as our students continue to move through. Um, like I said, our current, our soon to be fourth graders are the kid, kiddos that have had bridges since kindergarten. One of our goals is to ensure that all students are college and career ready when they graduate from Greendale High School. We also wanna ensure that we have proportionality in all of our classes. While I highlighted racial proportionality on previous slides, it's also important to note that we look at all facets of our diversity including socioeconomic, English language learners, and disability statuses when examining our classes and practices. When we began to research curricula, we focused on equity, rigor, alignment to standards and mathematical practices, and digital tools and access. The digital component is extremely important. Um, I think we've all realized that, especially as we've moved to this online world. Um, it became abundantly clear and exactly how important good online tools are for our students and staff. As we keep moving further into the unknown, it's important for us to have um, appropriate digital learning available for our students. Currently, the middle school uses the 2013 edition of Big Ideas Math. In researching these materials on ed reports and seeing our scores, it's apparent that we need to make a change. The instructional materials in grades six and seven do not meet the expectations for alignment to standards and grade eight only partially meets those expectations. Currently, our core high school math classes, that's the Algebra, Geometry, and Algebra 2, use the uh, Glencoe traditional materials from 2012. Um, and looking at ed reports, these materials do not meet the expectation for alignment to standards, and they don't connect and build upon learning from middle school, and students are not expected to engage at a level of sophistication appropriate for high school. It's evident by examining our middle and high school materials that we needed to make a change. We need to increase the rigor and expectations, just like we have at the elementary level. To continue the curriculum review process, teachers at the middle and high school, specifically, I'd like to mention Jane Patterson and Jeff Dieterich from the middle and high school and all of their work that they have done on this, leading the middle and high school teams has been extremely important and I appreciate their work very much. Um, they worked with their teams to create documents that contained all of the criteria for the new materials. All of those 
um, pieces are included in the board report. If you'd like to go back and look at those, I'm not gonna read those to you. Um, the criteria were broken out into four categories, math content, assessment, student experiences, organization and structure, teacher's role in technology. I'm sorry, that was five, not four. Um, the full list is included in the board report. And additionally, staff wanted to ensure that there was a connection to state standards, but also the standards for mathematical practices. Students should be able to make a sense of problems and persevere in solving them, reason abstractly and quantitatively, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others, model with mathematics, use appropriate tools strategically, attend to precision, look for and express regularity and repeated reasoning. That's also broken out further in the board report for you as well. The two, we looked at a couple different options, big ideas, because there's a new version out and reveal mathematics. The 2019 version of Big Ideas partially met the expectations for alignment. Unfortunately, the instructional materials only partially met the expectations for rigor and practice, and we determined that we needed to increase our rigor. So Big Ideas wasn't going to work for us. We then looked at Reveal, the Common Core Edition, the 2019 edition. This is actually produced by McDougal Littell, which is the same company that created the Glencoe materials, but it's all been revamped. Um, it had excellent marks on ed reports and by our staff. The instructional materials met the expectations for alignment to standards. There's appropriate focus on coherence, rigor, and balance. Materials support the effective use of technology, which is huge for our students and staff right now. The ability for teachers to create customizable online plans for individual students is extremely important. As we come back to school, we're not quite sure where our kids are gonna be. We provided educational opportunities and learning for them during the shutdown. But as we all know, kids are gonna come back in different places. So this individuality piece is going to be extremely important for our students and staff as we get back into the swing of things with school. We also looked at um, equity. We wanted to make sure that the curriculum had a strong focus of equity throughout its materials. Differentiated instruction for diverse learners across grade levels is included. Scaffolding lessons so that content is accessible to all learners is important. Tasks are embedded within the materials so there's multiple entry points for students that can solve problems in a variety of strategies or representations. And then also include extensions for students that might need that push in the other direction. The uh, materials also provide support, accommodation and modification for English learners and students with disabilities. Additionally, representation matters. It's important that our materials include a balanced portrayal of various demographic and personal characteristics. Multinational names are used in examples and in practice problems. Multiple ethnicities and both genders are used in illustrations. They're usually uh, comic-like drawings. Diversity of names throughout the problems are used in ways that do not stereotype characters by gender, race, or ethnicity. Finally, when multiple characters are involved in a scenario, they're doing similar tasks or job, jobs excuse me, in ways that don't express gender, race, or ethnic bias. There's no pattern of one character using more or fewer sophisticated strategies. Based upon the teacher feedback using the rubric criteria and the information from ed reports, the team determined that Reveal Math will provide our students the best overall mathematic experience. Typically there's $120,000 like you saw on Jonathan's slide budgeted for new curriculum materials for the departments that go through that review cycle. Being present at previous board meetings and listening to Jonathan tonight, we know the money is tight and we need to make purchasing smart purchasing decisions. Um, Jeff Dieterich and Jane Patterson have worked extensively with the vendors trying to get the best price for us. Multiple items were discounted. If you look at the board report, they gave us a lot of um, online licenses for free, which those are typically quite expensive. We have also determined that instead of purchasing materials, like Jonathan said, we would pay for them over a three-year period. We do have materials um, on the board report list, starting, I think, with the pre-calculus line. Those are one-year one extensions of online licenses for materials so that we can ensure that our students still have access to their college algebra, pre-calc, math analysis, AP classes, um, so that they can still access their online textbooks. Um, we decided that the material in these, those specific classes are still in a good place and we did not need to go out and search for um, different materials. And so I think those are all included in there and that's where I'm ending. That was quick. <laughs> At least it felt quick to me. <laughs> um, what types of questions do you have? So I just had a question regarding the textbooks, and by, by the way, it was a very good report. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, 
the the textbooks versus the licenses are we finding that most of our um content is being done online now or are they students still carrying a textbook we do a combination of both um, we significantly reduced the number of textbooks that we're ordering. We are not ordering a textbook for every single student, but we are ordering some, Kathy, to make sure that if a student wants that hard copy that they would have it available. We make sure that every student has an online license because we're one-to-one, -one, but then we do reduce the number of textbooks. So they're not the same amount as students that we were ordering. Um, sometimes it's a class set just so it's in class in case a student forgets you know, their, their Chromebook, not that they would ever do that, but they forget their Chromebook or something like that, that they still have access to the material. So it is definitely something that Jeff and Jane have considered making sure that we don't need hard copy materials for everybody. Middle so school is more likely to have the hard copies versus the high okay. school. That's what I was just going to say. It looks like, uh, according to this graph that we received, it looks like the middle school looks like they're one-to-one. -one. They, they do typically use those. The high school is moving away from that. Okay. And the, the change in um, computer, the digital device for students last year made it so that it is a touch screen with the stylus on which students can write. Um, and that made it more possible for us to be uh, uniquely digital in our math curriculum. When I know um, during the shutdown, um, my daughter is, she'll be a junior next year and she did a lot of note taking and stylus working directly on things that came home. So with her math stuff, she was doing homework right on, um, right on the Chromebook. It was really cool. I have a question, um, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you again for the um, detailed report. Um, if we go back to the beginning of the presentation um, where you talked about the uh, tracking, um, and you said that we're not ready um, to remove that yet. How many years do you anticipate um, to pass before we're ready to get rid of the tracking? Probably three to four, as we make sure that our students have that foundational knowledge starting in kindergarten, because that would be our current fourth, our soon to be fourth grade students. So they still have a couple years left at elementary, and then that would be a fundamental shift for the way that our math instruction is done, or the way that our math teachers have been teaching. So I would think if we were going to do that, we would want to have professional development for our staff around that and what that would look like to get rid of get rid of those levels and how you are going to meet the needs of all of the students in the same classroom. So I think we're definitely headed in that direction, Kim, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Thank you. I do think it's gonna require some of a push um, just as much as it did in 2014 when we shifted the sequencing at the high school um, to make it uh, Algebra two accessible to all students by 11th grade, um, but that push, that needs to happen um, once the middle school has raised their rigor overall and um, our students have had that experience in the Bridges math curriculum uh, throughout their elementary years. So two years at a minimum, um, but could take a year or two longer, depending on the push. Kim and Sarah, kind of along those same lines. So as you looked at, uh, you know, the representation and things, is there anything, uh, sixth grade is typically a year where we add some additional open enrollment seats, as well as we get some students from uh, some of the parochial schools uh, here in Greendale that come to the middle school. Is there anything that we need to be doing from an assessment perspective or from a, a parent engagement and communication with some of those students that may be joining Greendale for the first time? Is that a reason for, is, is that a reason that maybe we need to look at for maybe some of this underrepresentation? I don't think um, bringing in new students is a reason for the underrepresentation. Okay. We do have a process in place to identify uh, skills for readiness levels for the acceleration process. Um, I think that um, the underrepresentation has to do with um, the lack of rigor in our everyday math curriculum um, and the uh, um, lack of representation. So the standard shifted at the national level and at the state level in 2014 when we made the shift. And at that time, we changed the high school math curriculum and the middle school math curriculum, but we delayed the math curriculum review 
for the elementary because we just didn't see a product on the market that could increase the rigor and align with the standards. Um, and so that's why you are not seeing a K-5 adoption this year because we made that adoption in 2016. So <clears throat> I think our underrepresentation has a lot to do with um, all of the reasons that we've been talking about in terms of um, bias and um, how that's manifested itself in our classrooms and um, expectations not being there for all students. Um, and so that's been something that's been gradually shifting and we've seen great gains and improvements in terms of equity and closing gaps on um, achievement testing in our STAR data uh, at the elementary level. Um, and so in a, in a year or two, I think that we will see that gap narrow to the point that will either be proportional or will force that proportionality by um, leveling it out and having all students at sixth grade. So we are nearing that moment um, but no excuses. The reason that we have disproportionality has to do with how we've treated instruction up to this point and the shifts in 2016 in math and the learning that we've done over the last two to three years has made progress towards greater proportionality, but there's still more work to be done. And thank you, Kim, for your candor and, and transparency. I mean, I think like you said, that's just an area that we will continue to focus on and and um, we'll expect to uh, make progress there. And like you said, it may not be overnight, um, but we will continue to uh, ensure that we can make progress in that area. So we will bring this back to you in July. Um, in the meantime, there will be links to the recommended curriculum materials online. Um, and we can, as a board, um, without having to review and adopt new math curriculum, we can revisit the scope or the um, course sequence at any time during our course additions and deletions report in December. So if this year we want to address the, the course sequencing at the high school um, sooner than later, then we certainly could bring that forward, um, but we'll continue to push in that direction. I just, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kathy. I just wanted to make a, an additional plug um, after hearing this report, and, and I do appreciate the work that's gone into um, identifying the needs. Um, that as we are deciding and determining our discussion book discussion for next year, I think this would speak to maybe why we should continue on this path, um, per perhaps with the book that I mentioned, Excellence Through Equity, um, just in terms of us having that overall ar overarching, um, you know, a degree of um, uh, focus on, on this issue as well, I guess. Um, so I just want to put an additional plug in for that. Thanks, after seeing Kathy. the report. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that I was going to kind of touch upon and, and ask about is, uh, I appreciate all this, and, and maybe this is something that we can talk a little bit about in March when we when we get our alternative education and gifted intelligence report. Um, but but one of the things that you know I I, I want to make sure that we're addressing is you know with our gifted and talented uh, students, we do offer accelerated mathematics, right? Um, yeah. And I, I guess, you know, when you look at them, they, they go through the program at an accelerated rate. And then once they hit their senior year, um, the offers that we provide are very limited. Now we do offer opportunities outside of Greendale, whether, you know, it's through the, you know, the dual enrollment or things like that. Um, but I guess I, I'm wondering if maybe in March when we get that report, if we could talk a little bit about, you know, should we be looking at that? And I know it's a small group of, of students, but you know, how can we look at maybe that math progression differently for, for those students um, so that they continue to be educated in, in Greendale, um, and even though we've maybe made the decision to accelerate them at, in, at um, a middle school level so that they don't, you know, they don't just kind of hop out um, after, the, after their junior year. Yes, we can include that in the gifted report, the gifted report about programming for um, those students who are identified in the specific subject area of math. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Otherwise, 
Um, Sarah, thank you. And thanks to uh, Jeff and, and Jane for, for their work on this. Um, could I could I just um, add, I, I don't know if Axel has any thoughts because um, he, he's been sitting through the meeting tonight, but I would love to hear, hi Axel, I would love to hear from you as far as how you, maybe how you feel the math uh, process has gone for you personally or what your thoughts are in, in terms of this discussion. Um, I actually would like, I have some things to say. Uh, I was one of the people that I went into high school going directly into algebra and knowing me, I take a lot of AP classes. I enjoy taking AP classes. And I was really discouraged that I wouldn't be able to take calculus for my senior year. So like right now I'm working with my counselor to make that happen and trying to make sure that happens. But I feel that it should be kind of an easier transition for people in high school because, you know, there are times when in middle school we're kind of doing this like kind of black and white thing where we're like these students go to advanced math these students go to regular math but it's like some students when they're transferring from the middle school to the high school they don't have that much to catch up on to get to an honors math level so we should try to work with them as much as we can to help them make that slight adjustment to their to the way they look at math so they can get to the higher level. Thank you for, I appreciate your feedback. I wanna hear more about that. So <laughs> Axel, we can talk more and um, see what our options might be to do that. That's a good idea. All right, thanks Axel. Any other questions about uh, the math curriculum? Otherwise, um, as Kim mentioned, we will be bringing it back at our next board meeting to uh, approve and adopt the, the curriculum for um, math at the secondary level. This is, um, I think, another good example of not being complacent, um, right? So we're, you know, you know, when you kind of read this report, you're looking at all the areas the, to make improvement, but uh, one of the largest things, I work with higher ed on a, kind of my, my day job, if you will, and where they're spending a ton of money is on math remediation. And with less than 5% of our students, that's very atypical for high schools uh, and, the, and, the, and the graduates coming out. So uh, I wanna commend the fact that you are uh, not kind of sitting on the laurels and saying, hey, we're doing a pretty good job um, and how to, you know, challenging yourself to always look and, and do better. So I think that's harder to do than just, um, uh, you know, kind of staying with the status quo. So uh, appreciate that effort and energy that you've put into the Sarah and, and team. Thanks. It's that growth mindset piece that we want to keep, keep moving forward. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, so next on the agenda, uh, you know, an update on learning and programming during the school closures. So this is something that Kim has been sharing with us um, every, every month, just kind of keep, uh, keep up to date on where we are at with things. So, uh, Kim, you're, you're sharing your screen. It says reopening Greendale schools. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So um, I, uh, during communications, I shared some of the, the things that we're working on in terms of summer school, in terms of co-curricular activities, and in terms of graduation. Um, but right now, the question on everyone's minds and the thing that is causing a lot of anxiety across the region and across the nation is what our school is gonna look like in the fall. So we have had a team of teachers that began work about three or four weeks ago to really analyze what is it that we need to do and how can we move, um, what information do we need to move into our reopening and re-entry into the schools in the fall. So our goal is to make sure that students and staff have a, a return to a safe environment this fall, both physically safe uh, in terms of um, preventing illness and um, socially and emotionally supported. So this team of faculty has been working together to consider all of the aspects. And part of those aspects are uh, safety. So focusing on health, safety, food distribution and physical needs of students, staff and families. Um, and the larger team is broken down and there's some people looking at specifically at safety and I'll show you some of those universal precautions that we're discussing. Um, practices and procedures are really establishing ways in line with laws uh, that govern employment, finances, state requirements, and special education. The learning team is talking about instructional delivery models and making a plan to adjust scope and sequence learning platforms 
and address gaps in learning in addition to the instructional delivery models that we'll be using in the fall. And then relationships are establishing and maintaining communication pathways and ways to engage with school and stay connected as a community. Um, and this is really the spot where we're considering the social and emotional needs. So looking at all four aspects of that will hopefully lead us to a point in which we can re-enter the um, school setting in a normal or near normal way. Um, the phased reopening recommendations have been coming from federal, state, and local health officials. And there is gating criteria to move from one phase to the next phase of reopening. The, one of those is the downward trend in positive COVID cases. Uh, two is that anyone with symptoms is able to test. Area hospitals have the capacity to treat and area hospitals have sufficient PPE to be able to treat patients. And finally, that the local health authority has the ability to contract trace within 24 to 48 hours of a positive test so that they can um, isolate, help people to isolate um, with infection. So, um, in that, every time that they're able to say yes to all five of those, or yes or almost to all five of those um, on their weekly or bi weekly consideration, the health department is able to open and move phases through. So, phase A was the safer at home order, um, and phase B allowed some of our community areas to open from 25 to 50% capacity. So, restaurants at 50% capacity. Um, library at 50% capacity and other places were at 25% capacity. On May 22nd, our community moved into phase B. Now schools remained in safer at home through June 30th because the state order was still in effect. On Friday, the Greendale Health Department um, announced that we would be as a community moving into phase C. So our public library, for example, is moving into phase C where they will have normal operating hours and be able to house 75% capacity in their facility. And so that is going to, that is guiding how we're thinking about uh, how students can navigate our buildings and we can bring students back into school. And in order to do that, some of the safety things that we're looking at is um, what are universal precautions we can take as students and staff enter our building. And those universal precautions that we have started with those employees who are reporting to work at this time around our childcare, our park and recreation staff, our um, other services that we offer, what, that uh, students need to, students and staff need to stay home when they're feeling ill or displaying symptoms. And we're considering what does that look like? Is that a self-monitoring of everyone and they're being trusted to say that I've run through the checklist and I feel well enough to come to school to the school building, or is that monitoring as they enter? Um, how do we provide for six feet of distancing? Do we make how do we make sure that there's frequent opportunities for hand washing with soap and water, um, that we're disinfecting, uh, that we're slowing the transmission either through mask wearing or plexiglass shields, and that we're limiting our shared spaces for eating and cafeteria breaks. So those are safety precautions that we're considering. As we think about scheduling and reopening, we're looking at our classroom capacity and our school capacity. And we're examining a full range of options from fully in-person to fully virtual. And we're looking at scheduling options as well as how we can make modifications for how services are delivered within the school facility to accommodate social distancing and changes to traffic flow. And I want to reiterate that we are considering a full range of options, but nothing has been decided yet. I mean, in order for us to decide, um, we're, we'll be asking some questions and communicating with the community. So the learning team is really focusing on how do we best serve the academic needs for all students within the allowed schedule based on the phase of reopening we are at. Um, how do we focus on engaging students in their learning and supporting them socially and emotionally. Um, so that engagement matters and there's been a lot of things that have been put out uh, in the public, but we wanna make sure that our, that our students not only are making academic progress, but are truly able to engage in their learning um, within our schools. So in order to make our next steps and to think about where we're at, I will be sending a letter to families this week with information about our work in progress and uh, sharing information with staff from the work team um, at some point later this week or early next week. And then uh, following those, that information, we'll be sending surveys to staff and families about 
um, all the considerations we have for reopening so that we can get further feedback on some of the ideas um, being generated around how we can safely reopen for our staff and our students. And throughout, because I understand that that wondering and um, waiting for what school is gonna look like in the fall can be anxiety inducing um, on all levels. Uh, we will continuing, continue offering resources for wellness through the district pupil services pages and our uh, services around uh, SFAP that continues to be available to students and families as well as our um, other wellness activities to make sure that's, that students and families are able to cope with the stress that the pandemic, um, the trauma of the pandemic has brought upon many of us. So we are working um, and we don't have answers, but I am committing to um, have a plan that can be communicated to staff and families by August 1st. And we will have some information and surveys um, available to families and staff before the, um, the back to school check-in that will open at the beginning of July. So that's some information on what we've been working on. Any questions from the board? I'm sure you're probably thinking about this, Kim. Um, but just curious, is has there been any discussion about um, if there's a group of children that decide to stay home even though we may reopen? but the parents want to keep the child at home, how that learning takes place. Is it one teacher does it all or is it teacher kind of splits themselves in half? We've been exploring possibilities. Um, and the answer to that is it depends. There's a lot of things that need to be considered in that, but we have been talking about um, what if we return to face-to-face -face instruction, but there are families um, for health reasons that that want to choose to continue in a virtual environment, how will we um, manage staffing and um, be able to accommodate that learning, that desire for that learning environment, whether it be temporary or permanent. And we've had some conversations about how we can expand virtual learning opportunities. Some surrounding districts have uh, full virtual schools, but, um, and we've talked about the fact that sometimes our open enrollment students are leaving to go to online schools in other districts. So we are definitely considering, that's one of the innovations brought about by the pandemic. How do we offer a high quality virtual option to our students and families? Okay, thank you. Kim, I've heard talk from some districts regarding what they're calling rolling closures. Is that anything that's come across your discussion as well and um, how, well, I guess you can't say exactly how that would look, but is that something that Greendale has discussed uh, as far as having periods of time where there might need to be closures? So we um, are definitely looking at this phased reopening. So right now um, the village is in phase C. And so um, once the Safer at Home order ends on June 30th, then we are guided by the recommendations of local health officials based on what phase we will be in. Um, the statement was made that we will likely be in phase C for a long time. However, if there were to be an outbreak in one of the schools, there is a possibility that the health official could recommend that we return to phase A, which is a safer at home order for a certain period of time. And yes, we are preparing what would happen if we are rolling forward with uh, full reopening and full capacity. And then for whatever reason, we're forced into a safer at home order. And that has really been discussed as what have we learned and what could we do better in, from what we did this spring? And can we do that on a one day or a two day basis if weather forces a closure? Um, so how can we do this differently and how can we make improvements upon what we did? And there are surveys that are have already gone out about the learning um, from the, the spring and how we can make improvements, either whether that be uh, more synchronous instruction, which means everyone gets on at the same time and it's a real time meeting like this one, um, or if that is an improvement to asynchronous instruction or a combination of the two. Thank you. Well, Thank you, go, go ahead, Thor. I was gonna say, um, 
one thing I've been hearing kind of on a national basis is that potential for uh, students looking virtual. Um, and, and the last number I heard was 7% um, of, of the nation's students won't be returning to a in-person school. Um, obviously these are all predictions and they change every day. So it could be lower or less. And obviously it doesn't, it's normalized. It's not just looking at something like Greendale. Um, but I do think that that's an interesting, um, idea and option and actually potentially even opens up opportunities for us to engage additional students, um, through that virtual school option. So it's kind of an intriguing thing to think through. And then also helps supplement, like you said, when, um, we do have uh, the need to be in a virtual setting for all of our students, whether those are part of that virtual school setting or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks, Kim. Um, and, you know, from a personal perspective, I've started listening to, um, you know, what, what private industry, what businesses are doing to um, come back. And, and I think, uh, you know, what higher education is doing to uh, invite students back in the fall. And, and what the phrase that I heard is it's going to be an imperfect uh, return. So people, you know, people have to realize that, yes, ideally, students would be in classrooms, and ideally, you know, there'd be interaction with with other students that may not happen or that may look different for a time period um so people people can say well i wish this wasn't happening i wish that wasn't happening it is going to be an imperfect plan uh, but i think uh, what i've liked to, to what i've heard that i really like is that you've engaged with others um both within the village within the the community um within staff to understand what could it look like and it is going to look different and in some ways we will transform and and come out of this uh with improvements uh to the to the overall uh, education a axel any, anything that, that we should be considering you know you you've been living this now since mid-march as we all have but from a student perspective uh you you just finished your junior year and you know how, how did that what were some of the things that we, you we should make sure that we are thinking about as as you move into your senior year um hmm. i guess i guess we have to consider the toll that online schooling puts on like the students themselves i personally just me and also i know a lot of friends who found it very difficult to focus during during just like online learning because you know you have your parents walking doing something you have siblings you have pets so you I didn't get the full learning experience that I love getting when I'm there in person so I would say just if we were to go for a more electronic route trying to address the distractions in everyday life that diminish the learning experience that's been some good feedback you know uh, and in some ways people are more efficient when they're able to work from home uh, or study at home and in other ways um, there is inefficiencies um, to be had with that so um, that's some good that's a really good perspective Axel all right Kim anything else um, regarding uh, the update now at this time not at this time all right thank you um, any legislative updates then uh, yes, I actually do have a few things. Um, I mentioned this to Kim today, but um, the 2020 Title IX uh, regulations, uh, um, they, they are focusing on that right now and saying, well, it applies to the public schools, but um, they're talking about an institutional response by school districts to alleged or confirmed incidents of sexual harassment and how that's going to be dealt with. Um, there's an August 14th deadline right now where school districts are required to uh, create and implement a formal Title IX grievance process to address complaints of sexual harassment. Uh, this grievance process differs substantially from what most districts have as their discrimination complaint processes. I believe we do have a specific um, sexual harassment process in, in or policies in there, right, Kim? We, we have specific, so, so I think we're good on that. Um, the regulations are gonna impose various training mandates. They're also gonna impose new, new notice uh, requirements 
and if they're going to impose new record keeping obligations. So there, um, to this, there is a pending legal challenge right now. And Wisconsin is involved with the challenge that they um, are going to say on the basis of various aspects of new regulations that they're arbitrary and contrary to applicable law. So, so this um, whole um, potential um, change might might end up going by the wayside, but I, I'm not sure where they're at in the process with that. Um, I think there was just a, a vote taken on Wednesday, I think last week. Um, then the Legislative Fiscal Bureau um, just wanted to report that they show a decline in the state tax collections continuing in May, but it has not been as substantial as it was in April. Um, April in 2020 had an $870 million, um, which was below April of 2019, or it, yes, $870 million below April of 2019. As of May 2020, the collections are at 66 million below where they were at in May of 2019. So, so they're definitely this COVID has obviously caused, as we know, some very financial constraints. Um, the third item I had was the federal lawmakers um, are beginning to focus on challenges to reopening the K-12 schools and Kim just touched on that. The U.S. Senate, this is what was actually meant on Wednesday of this past week, the U.S. Senate committee held a hearing for the first time on Wednesday, June 10th. So, so at the national level, they are Kathy, I think you put yourself on mute. Sorry, did you hear any of what I said? Yeah, you did. <laughs> I think that last, I'm... Just that last sentence. So you heard about the then the U.S. Uh, Senate Education Committee held a hearing on Wednesday, June 10th. Um, so the last item I had was that the Wisconsin Department of Justice Office of School Safety is launching a Speak Up, Speak Out, a resource center to provide communities with a centralized safety tool. And it's going to be available at no cost to schools. This will help with threat assessment, critical incident response, and general school safety guidance and it's set to launch in the fall of 2020. So those are the items I have tonight. And I don't know if you have anything to add, Kim. All right, thanks, Kathy. Any board committee reports? Any uh, board updates from any of the, the committees, Park and Rec or Ed Foundation? Um, I did attend my first Park and Rec uh, meeting last week, uh, but we had a little trouble with the sound um, participating via Zoom. Um, so I'm following up with um, Jackie and I'll bring updates um, to, the, to the next meeting. All right, thanks, Kim. Anything else from any committee updates? As I mentioned before, the SWSA is um, doing a nice job collaborating and um, I've enjoyed my first, uh, my first meeting that I had. They, they actually did have a meeting where we also discussed how how the school districts were, how we handled the closing of this past year and um, just a discussion among school boards as to what was working and what areas maybe they need to focus on, you know, in the event that we have to go through these closures again. Um, so that, that was all I had to say with SWSA. All right, thanks, Kathy. Um, all right, so seeing no other uh, board committee reports, we are adjourned. Uh, our next school board meeting is on Monday, July 13th. So we only have one board meeting in July because of the, the Independence Day holiday. So enjoy everyone's uh, Independence Day holiday and we will uh, reconvene on Monday, July 13th. We are adjourned. Have a good night. <laughs>